everyone. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Judy Wellman, and I do a lot of work with Kathy and Carrie and a whole bunch of other people on the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House project. And we'd love to have you join us if you feel moved to do almost anything we can <laughs> use help with. Um, I also wrote a book uh, several years ago on the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. It's called The Road to Seneca Falls, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the Seneca Falls Convention. And in doing that, I, I did a study of all the people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. There were 100 people out of about 300 who attended the convention total. And tried to find out who these people were. And one of the things that emerged very clearly was that a lot of them were Quakers. So that got me kind of interested in Quakerism. In fact, it's one reason I became a Quaker, because I met Thomas and Mary Ann McClintock and a whole bunch of other historic Quakers. <clears throat> and I said, these are my kind of people. So <laughs> I am now a member of Syracuse by the meeting of friends. This is called The Promotion of Truth and Practical Goodness, and you'll see why in a minute, I hope. Can you see this OK? Is this yeah. working? Um, I'll talk fairly quickly. I put I, uh, text like this in case people are hearing impaired. They can see pictures and sort of hear and, or not. And also, it's kind of closed captioning, sort of. So, um, in the meeting house across the street on October 6 and 7, 1848, a whole group of people met in that meeting house and to form a totally new yearly meeting of friends. They called it the Congregational Friends. This group had come together as reformers for women's rights, Native American rights, African American rights for years. And they decided to organize a totally new Quaker group for the promotion of truth and practical goodness. And they adopted a document written by Thomas McClintock called The Basis of Religious Association. And in it, they said there's absolute liberty of conscience. Everyone here is totally equal equal rights for everyone. There will be no separate meetings of ministers and elders, <coughs> as both Orthodox and Hicksite Quakers then had. All the meetings are open to everyone, doesn't matter what sex, race, class, background you are. You don't even have to be a Quaker. And it's a reform organization. We're going to judge ourselves by our actions, and not by our theology. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they invited to become the keynote speaker. And after the meeting was over, an elderly Quaker in the back, Henry Bunnell, stood up and he said, they say it's in a sing-song voice, I don't know what that means, but if a hen can crow, let her crow. <laughs> Everyone laughed. And he came up afterwards and he said to Stanton, I didn't mean to raise the laugh on thee, I just meant that I think if a woman can do something and wants to do it, she should do it. <laughs> and Stanton passed around, said one of the um, students at Macedon Academy, Benjamin Gu, who was in attendance. Um, she passed around a petition for suffrage, and Benjamin Gu said he signed it. And Stanton later said in 1852, um, I consider myself a member of the Congregational Friends. Um, those leaders in that group really were national leaders in some of the most important equal rights movements before the Civil War. So how did they get started? What was their relationship as dominant culture with European Americans to people of Native and African descent? And why were they important for Seneca Falls? Most of you know that the first women's rights convention in the country was at Seneca Falls, New York, uh, July 19th and 20th, 1848. About 300 people attended, and we're, we have a couple of estimates, reasons to estimate that, including one person said, um, it, that's how many would fit in the seats in the balcony if you take like a 12-inch or 15-inch size for people and added up the number of seats in there. And Amelia Bloomer, whom some of you may know, said, I got there Thursday night and there wasn't any place to sit except in the balcony. I had to go to the balcony. So um, only about a third of those people signed what was called the Declaration of Sentiments. 68 women and 32 men signed in support of the movement. And the Declaration of Sentiments was patterned after the Declaration of Independence, except instead of saying all men are created equal, they said all men and women are created equal. Then the prologue is almost exactly alike. 
and accept, accept instead of 17 grievances of the colonists against King George, which if you read today are really boring, they had 17 grievances of women against a patriarchal establishment. And you read it today, and we're still dealing with every one of these jobs, education, voting, legal rights, family rights, church rights, personal respect. <laughs> uh, it's quite a, it's a remarkable document. Um, the popular perception, which I always had, of Seneca Falls was that it was mostly white people and that it was for white people. And I think to some extent that's true. It certainly was dominantly, predominantly white people who attended. Um, one of the reasons, um, well, a little background, Stanton was an abolitionist. A um, little background in, the, in that in a minute, but she wanted to create not another abolitionist or general reform convention, but one that was specifically designed to talk about the rights of women. And so the Declaration of Sentiments does not specifically mention race. She's deliberately trying to um, make it different than an abolitionist convention. But race was on everybody's mind. And one reason we know that is that Frederick Douglass, probably the most famous black leader in the country at that time, was there. And he signed the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments. He spoke in the de in, at the convention <coughs> itself. And so if we begin to look a little deeper, not just at kind of our stereotypes and the total numbers, um, and we begin to look at everybody, not just those who signed the Declaration of Sentiments, I think we begin to get a little more under nuanced understanding of the way that people at that convention thought about race. So we're going to look at a little background today and think about that. And this talk will suggest two main points. One is that almost every, everybody there that we know of, and I'm assuming probably most people, were abolitionists. And there were two groups. Political abolitionists were centered in Seneca Falls, but Quaker abolitionists from Waterloo, Farmington, Macedon, and Rochester made up the other major group who were there. Uh, they, most of those were non-voters. They believed in moral suasion. Um, and I'm going to argue as a second point that several people of African descent were probably also attending that convention, although they did not sign the Declaration of Sentiments that we know of. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask your opinion. Do you think I'm making the case for these two points, that most of them were abolitionists and that a lot of black families were there, or not? All the key leaders were directly linked to abolitionism. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass, Thomas McClintock. We'll take a look at those in a little more detail. Stanton was the catalyst. She was born in Johnstown, uh, wealthy uh, land-based lawyer parents. Um, her household had three enslaved people that she talks about, especially Peter Thibault when she was growing up as being very important to her as role models and babysitters. Um, she had cousins in Peterborough, um, Garrett and Ann Smith, who were major abolitionists, partly because they were very wealthy, they gave a whole lot of money to the abolitionist movement, so everybody went to Peterborough. And they organized there the New York State Anti-Slavery Society, which is a dramatic story in itself. And Stanton said every member of their household is an abolitionist, even to the coachman. Fascinating family. I would highly recommend looking at it more. It's hard not to talk to about them more because they're, but we, we got to move forward here. Um, at Peterborough, Stanton met, she was Elizabeth Katie Stanton, uh, Katie then met her future husband, Henry Brewster Stanton. She was a kind of high strung, funny, flirty girl, and she thought that Henry was already engaged, so she was very free and silly. And she said one day they took a horseback ride through the woods in October, autumn day, and Henry proposed. She was really surprised. <laughs> so, so they did get married, and, and Henry said, well, on our honeymoon, let's go to the World Anti-Slavery Convention. It's not every day you get an invitation like that. In London, which they did, the whole day of the first day of the convention was spent debating whether or not women who had been sent as delegates to the convention from the U.S. should be allowed to sit as delegates, and they decided no. But Henry, to his credit, voted yes. 
probably he would not have been able to stay married to Elizabeth Cady Stanton if he had not. And there in London, um, Stanton met Lucretia Mott, a very well-known Quaker preacher from Philadelphia, who was used to being free and thinking of herself as equal to anyone and being treated respectfully in the Quaker tradition. She was also part of a group that had organized a biracial Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. She had also helped organize three um, abolitionist conventions that were women's abolitionist conventions in the late 1830s. And she said later, when Stanton was thinking about writing a book about the history of women's rights, she wrote her letter and she said, from the time of the first convention of woman, the battle began. And she, she saw those as the real um, churning energy for developing a women's rights movement later. 1838, brand new Philadelphia Hall, the women are meeting there. Uh, Angelina Grimke from South Carolina is speaking and the hall burns down. And black women and white women, they say, walk out <coughs> hand in hand to protect each other, except Lucretia Mott, ever creative, walked up to the biggest, burliest attacker and said, would you help me, sir? <laughs> so he protected her as they walked out of the burning hall. Elizabeth Gady Stanton always thought of herself as an abolitionist, and she certainly had abolitionist connections with her husband, her friend Lucretia Maud, her cousin Garrett Smith, and she called herself a Garrisonian abolitionist. And these were people affiliated with the American Anti-Slavery Society who believed in what they called moral suasion. You appeal to the conscience of slave owners. You don't vote, you don't use power against them. And all of her life, the, the William Lloyd Garrison published a newspaper called The Liberator, and the subscription lists are all in the Boston Public Library. And there they are, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a, a subscriber to The Liberator from the time it began until the time it died in the 1860s. But here she is married to Henry, who's a political abolitionist, and who convinces her that, you know, why should people go to the polls and vote for someone who's against abolition instead of voting for an abolitionist? And so very early on, early as 1842, she understands the importance of voting for carrying out your ideals. That same year, she met Frederick Douglass in Boston. And uh, Douglas later remembered it was at the house of Joseph and Thankful Southwick. I think they were Quakers. And Mrs. Stanton, with an earnestness that I shall never forget, unfolded her view on this woman question. And for the rest of his life, William Lloyd Gar or Frederick Douglass became a woman's rights advocate. Absolutely, the rest of his life. His last public act was to appear on a stage at a women's rights convention in Washington, D.C. with Susan B. Anthony. And then he went home and died. <laughs> So, I mean, he was totally committed, and he credited Stanton with um, convincing him to do that. Douglas, as you probably know, was born enslaved on Maryland's eastern shore, Talbot County. Harriet Bailey's mother he barely saw. It was raised by his grandmother, Betsy Bailey. I personally give her a lot of credit, probably for Douglas's women's rights feelings. He escaped from slavery with the help of his wife, Anna Murray, and became an abolitionist lecturer. Um, starting in 1841, and this, he went to an abolitionist meeting on Nantucket, which was a totally Quaker-dominated island, and um, began to speak as an abolitionist and then entered eventually the larger national movement. Um, and he became, partly because of having met Stanton about that time, um, the only known black signer of the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments. Um, both Stanton and Douglas came to Central New York the same year, 1847. Stanton came in June, and she went to this house, which is now part of Women's Rights National Historical Park, her father gave it to her, he said. He didn't trust Henry at all. He thought Henry had terrible business sense. He gave it to her in consideration of the love and affection which I have for my daughter. And this is before the Married Women's Property Act was passed in April 1848. So if you can figure that out, I'd love to know. I, they must have known something that we don't know. 
Douglas moved to Rochester six months later in December, partly invited by Quakers who were affiliated with the Farmington Meeting House, including Amy and Isaac Post, who lived in Rochester. And he published the North Star, was able to buy a printing press as well as his own freedom because he just emerged from an internationally international tour of the Brit British Islands and uh, people in Britain had raised money to help him set up the press back here. I love this motto. Where did he get this? I can't help but think that Amy Post had something to do with it. Right is of no sex, truth is of no color. That's brilliant. I love this. God's the father of us all. Maybe he'd say parent. And all men and women are brothers and sisters. Um, when both of them came to central New York, they encountered a world that was in immense change, chaos almost, in every aspect of life, economic, social, political. Um, and Seneca Falls, and Waterloo, and Rochester, and Farmington were right at the middle of that change, partly because the Erie Canal goes just three miles north of here. And people have called that these they created not just changes in the economy and the family and social structure, but in religion and in values. Um, and people call this place the burned over district because the fires of religious revivalism had gone through so much. And they came right to the, the hot spot of those changes. Abolitionism across the country, meanwhile, had developed into these two main branches. One was the American Anti-Slavery Society. The official split was 1840. Quakers generally belonged to that, and they did not vote. And it's one reason, I think, that one of the, the, one of the only major question of the Seneca Falls Convention was the Ninth Amendment that Stanton had proposed that women should have the right to vote. Douglas supported her because both of them realized how important it was. But I think a lot of Quakers in attendance say, well, men, we don't vote. Why should women vote? We don't think it. so. That's an interesting context. Kathy? Do you mean Quakers didn't vote at all? Not just on this issue. They just didn't believe in voting. Yes. A lot of them did not. Uh, this, this period is going to change them. So some of the Quakers associated with Farmington are going to become political abolitionists, work with Garrett Smith, yeah, and Frederick Douglass becomes a political abolitionist after this too, but that's the kind of pivotal point of 1848. Um, the political abolitionists in 1840 had formed the Liberty Party, and in 1848 they're forming a Free Soil Party and the Liberty League, which is the more radical group. And interestingly enough, those two wings, the Garrisonian moral suasionists and the political abolitionists, are identified with two main buildings. They're both about the same size, they're both close to each other. One of them is this building across the street, which was just a hot nest of, of um, moral suasionists. William Lloyd Garrison spoke in Farmington at least twice. And the other one was the, uh, the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel in Seneca Falls, which became a hotbed of political abolitionism. For the moral suasionists, the people affiliated with the American Anti-Slavery Society, the McClintock family was key. And they had come to this area from Philadelphia in 1836. I think the world in this region would never be the same. Their house is now owned by Women's Rights National Historical Park. It's open to the public in Waterloo. The next year, Thomas McClintock became the clerk of Genesee Yearly Meeting of Friends which brought Quakers from all over upstate New York, Canada, and Michigan to every year annually to Farmington to meet in that meeting house, which supposedly held a thousand people um, every June. And these Quakers reformers developed, this, these, these terms are now my terms, but I think they fit very well, these Quakers. One of them is the idea of intersectionality, which actually came out of a lawyer named Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, who was taking a case about sex discrimination from a black woman, and she got shot down because they said, well, she's, she's not, you're not bringing it because she's black, you're bringing it because she's a woman. And she said, well, yeah, but she's a, we're, we're all black women, black men, white men, rich, you know, you can't just be one thing in isolation. 
So a, a concept that's really helpful to me is to think about this idea of intersectionality. And these Quakers really embodied it. They, didn't, they weren't just working for women's rights or Seneca land rights. They were working for equal rights for everybody without exception across the board, always, everywhere. And they recognized that it's got to be all or nothing, or they thought it did. They also developed what to me is a really important concept and we're working with now in lots of ways, including the Farmington Meeting House, this idea of allyship. And this is obviously a contemporary definition, but a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals or groups. And these Quakers, um, Amy Post, the McClintocks, the Hunts, um, built lifelong relationships with Seneca people, with African Americans. Frederick Douglass was part of this group of dominant culture, white people, Quakers, all of his life. Um, and I, it's a, a kind of model that I think a lot of us would find very useful today. Um, and they met here in Farmington every year in June. 1838 is a really key point because they bring out right up front the main issues they're dealing with. And they sign a petition to abolish slavery. They support Seneca Indian land rights. The Treaty of Buffalo Creek has just been passed. And within Quakerism, they decide that traditionally Quaker men and Quaker women would meet in two separate meetings, business meetings. And the previous disciplines had always said that uh, women, if women's minutes or decisions were accepted, it would always say men's meeting concurring. And this group said, they're quoting Galatians, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. They're saying, well, why do men's meetings have to concur with what the women just decided? And so they say, men's and women's meetings stand on equal footing of common interest and common rights. And that's 10 years before the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. Um, they also, um, in 1840, as we just talked about, <clears throat> continued to work on Seneca Indian land rights. This is Jimmy Johnson, who was a uh, Tonawanda main leader of Seneca. And they met with him and seven others, Seneca people at least, and probably their families um, here in 1840. And that same year, they also formed the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society here. And that group included men and women, blacks and whites, rich and poor, and it became a um, um, crucible for the development of the women's rights movement as women and men worked together for the rights of African Americans and the abolition of slavery. And that group sponsored lectures, and here are some of them, um, and they, they hired both black and white lecturers. Uh, Frederick Douglass first came to Western New York with Abby Kelly, who's the subject of our next program, July 17th, <coughs> and they traveled together. Part of their lecturing tour, they were uh, chaperoned by Quakers from Farmington Meeting, but people still call them a traveling seraglio, like a, you know, a Muslim harem. Uh, it, 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 but it made a huge, a huge impact, as you might imagine, on local people. And Abby Kelly, who had left her Quaker meeting in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, because they refused to be as radical and abolitionist as she thought they should be, um, <coughs> suggested to local women, and almost all of them, the first ones were Quakers, that they start these anti-slavery fairs, which collected all kinds of stuff you know, local agricultural products, but fancy goods locally from New England, from uh, people in Great Britain, women in Great Britain would organize these sewing circles to send stuff here that they could sell. It became the major fundraising um, avenue for abolitionists. And it started right here <coughs> with a lot of these Quakers, including Farmington. Meanwhile, in Seneca Falls, these political abolitionists are getting organized, and 
they are a coterminous in so many ways with the emergence of a new religious group called the Wesleyan Methodists, who broke away from the regular Methodist church to form an explicitly anti-slavery church in 1843. And they said, we're organized with a hierarchy neither of power nor of color. And the meeting house in Seneca Falls was the largest and the earliest in all of New York State for the Westlands. And it had a biracial congregation. And we know some of the names of people because we have some of the membership lists. At least three of the ministers we can identify as being on underground railroad places, including the parsonage for them is still behind this building. And lots of freedom seekers spoke there as well. <coughs> 1848 becomes a major turning point. There's a lot they talk about revolution all the time. The French Revolution, the German Revolution, the Seneca Nation organizes in 1848. And I love this one. It's a local merchant is talking about a market revolution. They're getting new stuff from New York City. It's like, wow. <laughs> and June 1848 was particularly key because there are splits both in the Quakers who are here meeting at Farmington and in the political abolitionists in Seneca Falls. They just split right apart, both groups. June 1848, probably two or 300 Quakers walk out of that meeting house and meet on the lawn and decide they're fed up with hierarchies among Quakerism, they're fed up with limits on working for abolitionism and women's rights with the world's people. Lucretia Mott was one of those who really was um, cheering them on. Same month, June 1848, the Free Soil Party forms end of the war with Mexico in 1848 opened up all the southwestern U.S. suddenly became owned, quote unquote, by the U.S. instead of Mexico. And the party organized to keep slavery out of that territory. Henry Brewster Stanton loved it. I mean, he spoke to 2,000 people in Canandaigua. He was just, they called him a free soil lion. Can you imagine without a microphone speaking to 2,000 people? I don't know how you did it, but Anyway, he was really in his element. Um, and Seneca Falls became a hot spot of free soil organizing, partly because uh, Henry Brewster Stanton is there. But there are petitions in the Seneca County Courier all summer signed by 400 different men in Seneca Falls for the free soil party. And a lot of their houses are still standing, so that's what those pictures are. And so here they are, the free soil people have just left their traditional democratic parties. The uh, Quakers have just split and left their traditional religious view. What are they gonna do? Where should they go? The next convention that happens is the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. And the people that are their leaders, they know, are people like Lucretia Mott, I think they decide, well, I don't, I don't care what the topic is. If Lucretia Mott and Frederick Douglass are going to be there, maybe they'll tell us where we should go and what we should do. And so they show up. The idea for this convention almost was accidental. Lucretia Mott's coming to visit her, her sister, Martha Wright, in Auburn. And with her husband, um, she visits um, prisoners in Auburn prison. Seneca people who are organizing, some are traditionalists, some are organizing the Seneca Nation in Cattaraugus. She goes to underground railroad places in Canada. Um, and she's invited to Waterloo for a little party of welcome uh, to the haunt at this house, which is still standing. And it's these four Quaker women plus Elizabeth Cady Stanton, because Stanton had met Quaker Lucretia Mott eight years before in London. And Stanton is really up to her. She's had it. She's, her husband, Henry, is traveling the country having a wonderful time. She's left home. She's got, how many kids does she have then? I think five. And she's thinking, uh, and so she says, I pour out the long-standing torrent, of, the torrent of my long accumulating discontent with such vehemence and indication, indignation that I stirred myself as well as the rest of the party to do or dare anything. And they decided, what do, you, what do you do as a reformer in 1848? Well, you call a convention. So they write a little note. Stanton takes it to the Seneca County Courier and 
Tuesday, it's published Tuesday, June 14th, and they call it quickly because they want Lucretia Mott to be there because she's their big draw. Um, and with, uh, the, that small group of Quakers really helped Stanton organize the convention. It wouldn't have happened without them. Um, and they wrote letters to people, like both Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth McClintock wrote letters to Frederick Douglass inviting him. Um, Stanton goes on Friday, the 14th, to the, she says, I'm taking the cars to your house, be there at 10 o'clock, we gotta get this, whatever we have to say at the convention into shape. She's usually given credit for developing the, the Declaration of Sentiments, but from what she says, after much delay, one of the circle, I think it was one of the McClintock family who took out the Declaration of Independence and that's what they decided to use as a model. So they meet in the greatest rebellion the world has ever seen, says Stanton, who was never modest about this. And about, they got about 300 people, most of them locally. Um, so the question is, were people, black people, other than Frederick Douglass there? I'm gonna argue yes. There were a very small proportion of black people in the census in 1850, which is the first evidence we have, who lived in the area. But many of them were active reformers affiliated with abolitionist movements. And these are some of the families of color that I think quite likely showed up in Seneca Falls. And here are some examples. Solomon Butler ran the taxi service, so he'd bring his wagon and horse to meet everybody coming in on the train. Very obvious person is the street named after him in Seneca Falls. He had a daughter who married Hiram DeMunn in Waterloo, and DeMunn was active in the Black Convention Movement in New York State. This is the house they lived in. And they lived right next door to two of the white Quaker signers of the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, the Jackson family, um, again, lived near Azalai and Margaret Schooley, who actually had land also in Canada with black people that I think they're moving back and forth on the Underground Railroad thing. Thomas Jackson was probably a freedom seeker. Um, he's got a lot of abolitionist connections with petition subscription. We have a subscription list to papers from Seneca Falls. Um, Mary Jackson, Either his wife or daughter, both of them were named, and I'm not sure which. She bought this house in her own name in 1857. It's still standing. Uh, they were also very associated with the McClintocks. They organized um, this Disciples of Christ Church, which met in the uh, community room over the, cent over the McClintock drugstore. Um, they, th there are two names here. They, belonged to the Waterloo Female Temperance Society, as did Elizabeth McClintock. Uh, and Mary, Mary uh, Jackson lived with the McClintock family in 1850. And then she married this barber, um, Joshua Wright, who had escaped from slavery in Maryland. This is a house that he owned. Um, he was one of the two black trustees of the Wesleyan Chapel. Um, and he's buried there in the Wesleyan, mostly Wesleyan cemetery, along with mostly white people. Um, one of the most interesting, I wish we had a picture of her, is Abby Gomar. She was born in slavery, don't know where, about 1820. She, and where I first found her, well, it's either one of these local articles or in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's History of Woman Suffrage, because she used her as an example of a black woman who owned property and could not vote in the history of women's suffrage. And I think most women's history scholars didn't know who Abby Gomar was, completely missed her. And yet, here she is, a local black woman, property owner, and she went to the Episcopal Church, which Stanton also attended. Um, she wrote to Martha Wright, she said, I hear a rumor that I've been a member of the Episcopal Church, and she said, if my women's rights scruples let me do it, my abolitionist ones certainly wouldn't. Uh, I feel as if I've been accused of petty larceny. I consider myself a member of the Congregational Friends. So, um, and one of the ones we know most about is Thomas and Sarah James and their daughter Martha. 
He also was a barber. He lived in this house, which is right next to the train station in Seneca Falls. He was also a trustee of the Wesleyan Church. He subscribed to any slavery papers, signed petitions. Um, and he became a community developer. This building is still standing, but it's been covered up. It's now a bank. You wouldn't recognize it as the same building. But he built this business block and the newspaper articles about him in 1863, Mr. James, who's a fugitive slave, is the possessor in this village of real estate to the amount of twelve or $15,000. And Stanton has a, a funny note, 1852, she says, James the barber cut her hair short along with about 12 other women in Seneca Falls because it was part of the dress reform movement and they were trying to get rid of their long hair and their long dresses. And so we know that she knew him, everybody did. Okay, do you think, on a scale of one to five, do you think this is a good case that most of the people who went to the Seneca Falls Convention were abolitionists? Who would say one? Who would say five? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Anybody in the middle? Okay, this is the tougher one. Do you think that several black families probably attended the convention? Who would say one? Who would say five? Closer. You want four? No. Do I hear four? Do I hear three? <laughs> three? Okay, cool. Okay. Just to me, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but one question that relates to that is, through your research, is there much written about the other 200 people? No. Like, why didn't they sign? Were they not around that day, or we don't we know don't why know. they didn't? That we wasn't don't know. Recorded. Stanton was pretty adamant, and this is the other major issue besides voting rights at the convention, that you can see a little tension coming through the minutes. Lucretia Mott wanted a general reform convention, and at the end, she proved proposes a resolution that says, let's let have the next convention be a more general character. She wants everybody equal all the time, everywhere, never mind, you know, picking out just women. <laughs> Stanton is very determined that it should be a women's convention, and she wants the first days for women only. She wants only women's voices. Um, she hasn't, they have an argument, should men sign the Declaration of Sentiments, and Stanton says, no, this is a women's movement, it should only be signed by women. So 32 men did sign, but, but the caption was, in support of the movement. Uh, so I think there's that kind of split, and I'm wondering if some of the um, local people didn't sort of say, well, Stanton doesn't want us to sign, like, you know, Thomas Jane, I'm a man, so I better not. You know, I think that's probably one of the things that was happening. And who knows, maybe a lot of people didn't agree with it. I don't know. We know nothing, absolutely nothing about them. Okay, afterward, um, you, you hear a lot, some people say Anthony went to the Seneca Falls Convention. She didn't. She met, William Lloyd Garrison comes to Seneca Falls in 1851. And, um, um, what do I try? Amelia Bloomer, who's the editor of the Lillian, after whom the Bloomer short dress is named, introduced uh, Stanton and Anthony, and there's a statue there you can see now in commemorating that. Um, women's rights conventions were held every year from 1850 to 1860, except 1857. Do you know why? 57, the main, the main organizers, and there weren't that many, like four or five. All of them, except Anthony, who was single, were pregnant. Anthony was so upset. <laughs> but Stan says, just relax, this is part of life, and next year we'll come back together. Um, and a lot of black conventions began to incorporate women as delegates. Um, uh, Jermaine Logan, who had escaped from slavery in Tennessee and was called the King of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse was the vice president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Convention in Rochester in 1853, for example. And you find a lot of black people, black men, whose names we know, supporting women's rights in that period. So it's just, you know, it challenges what we thought we knew. And these congregational friends keep meeting. 
and keep around the idea that equal rights is for everybody, including everybody in this room and everybody coming to these meetings. 1854, they have this, they, they advertise in the, the North Star or Frederick Douglass's paper most of the time, but this is a call to the convention and I just love this, so I'm going to read it. The platform is broad and comprehensive, admitting the most perfect liberty of conscience, an assembly in which Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans, by which they meant traditional Seneca people, men and women of all names and no name may labor together for the promotion of human welfare, but with no other law but the law of love. I'm just amazed. And they did. Um, they, you know, the, they were just men and women, black and white. I don't know of specific names of Seneca people or of Mohammedans or Jews, but um, in 1866, this very same group emerged on a national scene. They formed the American Equal Rights Association right after the Civil War to secure equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. And it's the very same people that are part of this congregational friends that organized right here. It's Frederick Douglass, Lucretia Vaught, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Charles Lennox Ramon. They didn't last. They split apart in 1869. And the women's suffrage movement organized two national groups. The national was dominated by Stanton and Anthony, and Sojourner Truth was part of that group. And then the American women's suffrage was mostly uh, dominated by New England people. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was part of that group. Some of you may know from a talk we had last year. Not for 72 years did the, it took 72 years for the U.S. government finally to decide that women actually could vote as citizens, 1920, 19th Amendment. But as you probably are very aware, if you look at the news anywhere, anytime, we're still struggling with every one of these issues, including voting rights. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was basically eviscerated by the Shelby v. Holder 2013 thing. Um, and all of the issues at Seneca Falls, religion, law, family, education, right to vote, are still challenging all of us as we live here in this country today. And I think these issues of gender and race, one thing, the past is never past, it's part of us. So it affects us. And to me, it's good to know that there were people in the 1840s who tried to um, bring ideals of equal rights to everyone. And it gives me some hope that maybe we can learn from some of their ideas and carry them on. Thank you so much for being here. When was the, the split, the Hicksite and Orthodox split, do you know when that was? Mm -hmm. 28, and it really hit Farmington. Okay, uh, and then the first, uh, well there was a meeting house in the 1796, I think, and it was rebuilt, a little uh, log one, right in front of this lawn, there's a big granite marker that's still out there about where it was. And um, in 1816, there were so many people coming from all over this huge region that they built this one across the street. And in um, 1828, the Orthodox Hicksite split all Quakers across the country. And there is an interesting two lists, one kept by Orthodox friends and one kept by Hicksite friends. Each one of them calls themselves friends and the other ones are somebody else. <laughs> but the total group, there's almost a thousand Quakers in this meeting. Uh -huh. A thousand Quakers in Farmington meeting in 1828. And we know their names. Uh, and they're all online if you want to look up Quakers and you're doing genealogy through Swarthmore. The other question I have, which just because I don't know, know those details of history, when were trains, were they all coming by horse and buggy? Um, Train, the first train in Seneca Falls was 1842. 1842. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them could have come to the Women's Rights Convention by train. They could also, we you know Charlotte Woodward said she had a whole um, cartload of horse-drawn cart with people in it coming that way. Right, um, right. But that was pretty much it. I mean, there were, when the canal, yet, the canal was what, 1860? Could have taken a canal boat, it was 25. 1830, is that? 1825. Yeah, but I was, it's all, 
works together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's really such a huge transformation to think you could get in a train after 1842, and, and you probably came there by ox cart. Mm -hmm. it's right. Like, it took a while. Yeah. Quite amazing. Huh. But was there communication, as far as they know, through the whole, like the whole Quaker community from the? Oh yes, it's one Quaker. of the thing, reasons they were so effective at these reform movements because they meet at annual meetings here, or um, Orthodox friends were still part of New York yearly meeting Orthodox, so they go to New York City. Okay. Or a lot of them would go to Philadelphia to meetings, but then they'd also have quarterly meetings, which would be like the local ones, go to Minden, Farmington, Palmyra, back and forth. Then you get the monthly meetings, and then local groups would have the midweek meetings also, the preparative meetings. And so one of the reasons I think it's they're so important in the Underground Railroad is they're, this group's transnational. They're Canadian. They're always going back and forth to... Uh, Norwich and um, Toronto and a couple other places. And in fact, the specific group have property in Norwich, which is still a Quaker community. And they have, there's an old British Methodist Episcopal Church graveyard there. They, had, they have mills, we know we have, they have a beautiful family photograph album of a black family from Palmyra. So I think these Quakers are, you know, taking black people across the border just because that's what they always do. Yeah. And, and helping them with jobs and it's just quite, and, and that story really needs to be pieced together more. It's really quite remarkable and has, has never been told. Um, it's breathtaking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really is. We also know in Farmington, in fact, right behind here in the graveyard, there's a, <clears throat> Graveyard is gravestones for Selby Howard, his wife Marie Howard. They were born in Maryland, and Selby's gravestone reads, born a slave, um, lived, um, lived a free man, died in the Lord. And his home was just kind of two blocks over and that way around the corner. Um, I don't know if you, any of you know the story of the Pearl, which was, there were 77 people trying to escape from slavery on this ship, April 1848, called the Pearl. They were all, they were becalmed. Every one of them was recaptured and sold into slavery, including the these two young teenage girls, the Edmondson sisters, who were to be sold in New Orleans, sent down there as kind of you know concubines. Their their parents were just, and their father Paul came up here and he went. Like he raised a lot of money from Plymouth Church in New York, and the they were finally repurchased for two thousand two hundred fifty dollars in Richmond. So long. And all the stories about them said they were sent to school outside New York City. They were sent to a school right here in Farmington. Mm -hmm. It's over on Victor Road. It's still standing. It was called the Bird's Nest School. It was set up by five Orthodox Quaker women. And they lived right the, in a house, we think, that's still standing right over there, too, with William and Eliza Smith. I mean, it's like, whoa, really? And then they become part of uh, Harry Beecher's, they're in Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. There's a little guy to, to it tells who they are. Harry Beecher Stowe helped raise money. They were sent to, uh, uh, one of them died, one went to Oberlin. He went back to New York City, set up a school for black kids, and, or helped with a school that was set up by Emily Holland, who's a Quaker from Sherwood, and Bertilla Minor, who actually came here to Farmington to get ideas about, and I think it's the Edmondson sisters that helped inspire her to do that, because then she's working with the Edmondson family in Washington, D.C. Mm. And it's like all of these, these nationally important stories, it's almost like, it, I hate to say this, every road leads to Farmington. You start looking a little, a little past the main story, they end up here. How come we didn't know this before? <laughs> we need a tour, because I mean, that, that, the, that little house is so cute up there. And Austin Stewart <coughs> escaped from slavery in 1815, came right to Farmington. And so did his sister Susan. And I mean, it's just like, was New York State, if, if there was an escaped slave, they could be returned? 
returned, right, from New York State or not? Um, or yes. Um, until New York, until 1841, uh, an enslaver bringing anyone in slavery into New York State could keep them here for nine months and they would still be enslaved. So a lot of people would just say, okay, it's, you know, eight, it's eight and a half months, I'm going to go back to Virginia for a week and then I'll bring them in again, I can stay another nine months. 1841, New York State Legislature passed several key laws. One was, the minute you cross the New York State line, you are free. Hmm. And abolitionists, including a lot of black abolitionists, knew this and would, they'd get on canal boats, you know, a white family with a black woman taking care of their baby, and they'd go up to her and say, you're in New York State, did you know you're free? Do you want to go across the river or come home with me? I mean, it was really, but then the federal government kind of got fed up with it and said in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act, um, federal marshals are required to assist anyone who uh, is trying to get back their slave property. Uh, they had to go before a federal marshal, but the accused person couldn't testify on their own behalf. And anyone who helped someone escape was subject to a $1,000 fine and six months in jail. So the federal government really tried to take over and say this isn't going to work to have it, any free states in the country. And it, of course, really energized abolitionists to say, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so the, the people that were here, like the ones in Waterloo, um, had papers documenting their freedom? We don't know if they had free papers or not. I suspect right. not. But they were still at risk then? Yes. Oh, yes. That, that was oh, what yes, I was trying to say. That's why his came how public you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it became, there are examples like um, Oswego's a good example of people being re recaptured and taken back to slavery. Right. There, was. there are also lots of places like Syracuse, Jermaine Logan has escaped from slavery. Puts a note in the paper, he says, I escaped from slavery, Tennessee, everybody knows that. If you need help, come to my house at 263 East Genesee Street. And they, <laughs> considered that they called themselves the Canada of the America because they said no one will ever be retaken here. But then the federal government says, Daniel Webster comes to town, he says, okay, we're gonna, this is a case study, we're gonna challenge you, you cannot be a free city. At the time of the next anti-slavery convention, if need be, and sure enough, that fall, they try to recapture Jerry Henry, who is escaped from Missouri, the federal government does, but like 2,000 people hit the streets and they recapture Jerry Henry and they take him, hide him and send him to Canada. He ends up in Kingston. The federal government makes four or five efforts, James Hamlet in New York City, um, Shadrach, whatever his name in Boston, um, to make case statements that they're gonna enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, but they rarely do. And local pe it just inflames local people to say, no, it's not happening here. <laughs> there was one movie about some man from the Albany area I thought was yeah. re -pre taken back, and then he got free again. He did. Um, um, so I'm trying to remember his name. Harriet Tubman helped. But you know, especially black people uh, seem to be most more than whites, physically active in grabbing people and getting to the streets and rioting and saying, you know, we're, you're not taking them, you aren't. But there was a really sad one, uh, it was about 1821, I think. The Amy Post tells about this, about a young woman who'd escaped from slavery. She married somebody in Rochester, had a baby, was recaptured, taken to Wheeling, West Virginia, and killed herself rather than be enslaved mm -hmm. again. That, but that's before the Fugitive Slave Act. But, you know, it must have been terribly tense. In, in any case, even if you're free, like Solomon Northrup is a free man, and he gets sent 12 years to the Louisiana plantation, it can't, yeah. Complicated. Huh? And the Edmondson sisters, just a quick story. Uh, their names were Mary and Emily. Um, so we look in this, and they were like 1850, we know they're here. So we're looking in the 1850 census. The only, and there are 14 and 15, I think. The only black women listed in the census, well, actually one black woman, 
that's anywhere near the right age. She's called Sarah Chaplin. William Chaplin is the one who had helped, who had escaped, helped them escape into Washington, D.C. She's living with William and Eliza Smith in this house that's still standing. It's a lovely little house. And there's only one of them. And she's listed as age 25. So the way we're reading it is, they're, they won't, Quakers want to be honest. So I have a black woman living here. Her name is Sarah Chaplin, and they take Chaplin because she's the guy who got her out of slavery. <laughs> they call her 25, hoping, and what they're trying to do, I think, is not create a record that anyone would follow, a written record where they could find her, but trying to also be sort of honest that, yeah, everybody knows this, and there really were two of them. So <laughs> it's just, um, you, you kind of, what's going on here? And, it's just fascinating. And you wonder what must have affected people. The Orthodox feeding was actually at least as active in abolitionism as the Hicksite one was. It didn't seem to matter whether you were Orthodox or Hicksite. If you're in it, you're in it. So. Do they, uh, do they all communicate all the different? I think my, my ancestors were in Maine and the Quaker. Did they all, I know there's all over the country. Uh, a lot of them did. Uh, there were newspapers and they traveled a lot because they were always going to these meetings. But there was less communication, I think, because New England yearly meeting was totally different from New York yearly meeting or Genesee yearly meeting. So, but who knows? I don't know. Certainly had some. And not all Quakers were. That's why they split apart in June 1848. A lot of these Quakers were quietest. They're saying, we don't want you coming into meeting talking about abolitionism. We don't want you working with the world's people. They're not Quakers. We don't want you uh, saying we can't have meetings of ministers and elders because everybody should be equal. No, not everybody should be equal. So they just couldn't get it together. That's why they split in 1848 because the reformers were so totally committed to equality, inside and outside. Um, it's a, in a way, it's a prototype for what Friends General Conference now is today. Yeah, but it wasn't abolitionism that split them apart, because a lot of Orthodox people were very active. Um, James C. Hathaway, Joseph C. Hathaway, whose house is right down there, was one of the major organizers of the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society. Um, William Wells Brown, some of you may know, was the, known as the first black novelist. He wrote a book called Clotilde or the President's Daughter, which was supposedly based on the Sally Hemming and Thomas Jefferson story. And he, he lived in Farmington for three years or so in the mid-1840s, and he wrote his first autobiography here. And Joseph C. Hathaway's house is down there, wrote the introduction, and it's just a beautiful introduction to it. And it's just amazing. Well, more to come. Come back. Yes. Thank you. Very good. I'll see you again. Thank you so much.